Welcome back, y'all. It's Ready Set, and today we're going to be going over a quick guide to getting started as an esportscaster. But first, just so you know that I know what I'm talking about, a little bit of background on me. My name is Ready Set. I'm an esports caster here in North America. If you know me, it's probably from the Brawl Stars Championship Series. I host North America and a handful of other regions. I also host Queso Cup in North America, No Tilt North America. Basically, if it's in NA, so am I. I got my start in Brawl Stars esports about a year ago, and suffice to say, I have grown a lot since then. I'm doing the official Brawl Stars esports stuff now, and hopefully, Hopefully, I'll be up on the stage later this year at the World Finals. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get on to the actual guide. Y'all, today, I have the pleasure of partnering with none other than Alienware to bring you a comprehensive beginner's guide on esports casting. I bring you what I believe are the four cornerstones of being a good esports host. This guide's gonna be composed of four segments. That's gonna be tech, play-by-play, analysis, and hosting slash fill. Also, quick disclaimer, this is by no means supposed to be a definitive guide, just what's helped me become a good caster over the last year. Cornerstone number one, tech. Obviously, you're gonna need the right hardware to get started. Most important thing is actually gonna be your microphone. Whether you're on camera or in game, the viewer is gonna hear your microphone. Doesn't have to be an excellent microphone, but you'll at least wanna position it in a place where those P's, T's, S's, those harsh vowels are not gonna make your viewer feel like they're in the middle of a hurricane. Also, your camera and your lighting. You might find it useful to place some kind of lamp in front of your face. If you can get it kind of dim, then that's even better. You can also point your lamp at your wall, like I do, and get some good soft ambient lighting in your room that illuminates your face and makes it not so dim around your face. Also, more light means that you don't have to crank up the exposure on your camera and you'll probably get some better frame rate out of your webcam. Ring lights and key lights are super, super useful, but for the beginner, a simple lamp pointed against the wall will do. Next, your computer. It's definitely going to be super helpful to have a powerful PC to run all the software if you're streaming from your own computer. If not, you don't necessarily need a super powerful PC, but it's at least going to be useful to have a second monitor, which obviously I have. Also, something you can configure your computer to do is have some sort of mute bind that mutes your mic so that you can clear your throat or kind of talk to someone off in the side uh, if you need to do that while you're casting. Finally, your internet. If you don't have the greatest of internet, then you might have to do whatever you can to reduce the bandwidth that you're using. Reducing the resolution on the feed that you're watching might help a lot, but at the end of the day, the best thing that you can do to have the best of internet is just to have a better plan. I'm sorry, but cranking down the resolution is not going to help your upload speed, and if you have poor upload speed, then all your viewers are going to see is some gross, pixely, kludgy stream. Finally, this isn't really a piece of technology, but it's definitely something you're going to want to have in your setup. Something to drink. Oh my gosh. When you're talking and you get a dry mouth, it is just the worst thing in the world. Keep a drink nearby. That way, you can keep your mouth kind of not dry. It will significantly improve your experience and your viewer's experience. All right, that does it for cornerstone number one. Let's get into cornerstone number two. Cornerstone number two, play by play. This section is all about just narrating out what you see on the screen and guiding the viewer around to what you're seeing and helping them see things from your view. The big difference between an esports show and say a television show is that in a television show, the producers position the camera to direct you to see what they want you to see. In esports though, it's all the players on the screen doing all kinds of things at once. You're gonna have to tell the viewer what to look at. Guiding the viewer is gonna make the content a lot more digestible for them and it's gonna make it a lot easier to watch. A good way to do this is you can just give the viewer some instructions. Look over here, direct your attention to this side of the map. Oh, look at the enemy side of the map. Power up from Zar has more or less decided the game here on the right hand side of your screen. I want to talk about the 1v1 on the right lane though. Pretty much a stalemate on the right lane. Of course, you don't want to be too broad. I'm being broad for the purpose of example. The more specific you are with your instructions, it's going to be that much easier for the viewer to digest. Another way you can use specifics is say, look at this player and call them by name or call them by the character that they're playing. That way, it's easier for your viewer to find them. Zulon coming out here on the B versus second also on the B. Another thing you want to do is don't jump around too much. If you mention something new that's happening on the screen, your viewer is, of course, going to have to look for that thing that you're talking about. And the further away it is from the previous thing you were talking about, the longer it's going to take for them to find it. And that could lead to some confusion if you're jumping around long distances and very often. Right. Another important element of play-by-play -play is providing context. By context, I mean set the scene. We talked about how in a TV show, producers will position the camera so they can focus on certain things that they want the viewer to watch. For you as a caster, providing context means creating the setting for the player. This is going to be all about the state of the game that's going on. This could be things like 
What's the score? What are the bands? What's the format of the game? Is it a best of three? Are there two bands? Things like that. Things that the viewer is going to be asking that you want to answer before they can ask it. And take a look at our format for today. It's going to be a top eight single elimination bracket. Uh, best of three format for our quarterfinals. And then as we move into our semifinals and finals, it's going to move to a best of five. Two blind brawler bands per team. We're going to see between two and four brawlers banned across the entire match. And it's going to be Tribe Gaming winning game number two, forcing game number three here in Heist. That is going to be Sag tying up this set one to one. Play by play is all about feeding the viewer information that is not disputable. It's all facts, but it's just the facts that you think are important. And the facts that are going to be important to you as a caster to communicate to the viewer are going to be the ones that make the match easier for them to understand. If this is a bit of an abstract concept for you, just put yourself in the position of the viewer and think to yourself, hmm, I wonder what I would want to know. I wonder what I would want to hear from the caster if I were the viewer. Trickle through. IX, they're counting down to the 20 second mark, and here comes the speed. Tribe Gaming knows it's drive time. Let's get in there. Corey and Tyrant pushing up the right side. Zulon now picking up that power up. And IX Gaming so on the back foot. Will they be able to recover? They just gotta keep the defense second. It's being denied. In summary, play by play, it's all about giving the viewer facts, just the facts that you think are important to their understanding of the match. And that's it for cornerstone number two. Cornerstone number three analysis. Right, play-by-play -play was all about giving the viewers the facts, so this part is going to be all about drawing some conclusions from those facts. A good way to approach this is start with the facts and then see where your mind takes you. For instance, the team is playing this set of characters. What sort of strategy do you think they're going for? Fiasco, they want to get some action quickly before everyone is too buffed up. This section is all about your opinion. Team A is going to have a huge leg up on Team B since this character on Team A counters a character on Team B. Right, so you see we're starting with the facts and then we're just stating our opinion on it. Another element of analysis is put yourself in the player's shoes and try and think about what they're thinking or feeling. I wonder what IX has in their back pocket. I don't think they were uh, necessarily preparing for you know, like such a tough uh, quarterfinals match. Are they thinking about shifting their strategy? Are they thinking about the objective? Or are they thinking about getting a kill? Or are they thinking about playing for control? He's going for the control. He's just shooting those projectiles onto the objective and assisting his teammates. If you know details about a specific player, you can draw some conclusions from that. This player is really comfortable on this character. So I think that since this match is getting pretty close, they're gonna shift towards a character that they're more comfortable on. Another strategy for analysis is try and put forth your predictions for what's gonna happen. Really, we're talking about the near future here. So you could say, when so-and-so gets their ultimate or super, it'll be a huge game changer. We can also take a look at an example where play-by-play -play meets analysis. Player A is going for a kill, or player A is going for an objective. The fact is that they're walking towards the objective, or they are attacking an enemy and trying to get a kill. The Ben laying down the controls, picking up a kill, now turning his attention over to the right hot zone, looking to get more control and more damage. The analysis is that they're going for the kill or they're going for the objective, right? You're trying to put yourself in your players' heads and talk about what they're thinking about. I hope that makes sense. But with that, that does it for cornerstone number three. Cornerstone number four, hosting and fill. Hosting and fill are the parts of the show where there's no actual game to comment on. Hosting is welcoming the viewer or guiding the direction of the show. Probably the most host-y thing you'll be doing is transitioning from one scene to the next. This could be transitioning from a sequence where your full webcam is shown and you're talking to the audience to the actual game itself. And you could transition that like, let's put a pin in that guys, let's get into game number two, set number three. That's just an example. I completely made that up. Perfectly said, Ready. I'm going to miss you, but we are going to say goodbye and give Ready a little bit of a break. My man Teddy is going to join us after the jump, but first, a word from our sponsors. If you have a lot of moving parts, so a lot of people working on the production, it's good to have a run of show, which is a document that has a schedule of the entire show, sometimes even down to the second, so that everyone's in sync and everything knows the schedule for the show. Right, now let's talk about filling. At the end of the day, the players start when they start, and it's your job as a host to keep the viewers engaged while everyone is waiting on the players to start. That's what filling is. It's providing commentary not related to the actual game that is, well, of course, not actually going on. This could be talking with your co-host if you have one, speculations and predictions for the next game, cracking jokes, and just being yourself. You could also talk 
talk about storylines. You, as a host, are a storyteller, and players and teams have interesting stories that need to be told. Maybe this roster recently picked up a new player, and they're completely knocking it out of the park. Maybe Team A and Team B have faced each other in the Grand Finals four months in a row, and Team A has always won. Make the players more than just people at a computer playing games. Make them all-stars. It's all about how you present it. And that's it for hosting and filling. Right, well, that does it for the four cornerstones of being a good host, or at least what I believe is being a good host. Tech, play-by-play, -play, analysis, and hosting slash film. If you keep all the stuff I said in mind, you should have the know-how to navigate your first time hosting esports. My advice is to watch some esports tournaments and listen for the things that I was talking about. Also, you might find it useful just to straight up mute the tournament and have a crack at commentating it yourself. Practice is key. And also, never look at chat while you're casting. It will always bum you out, and it will affect the way that you cast. But guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope this helps you get on your feet as an esports caster if you're interested. But as I always say, all good things must come to an end. This has been Ready Set. Remember to play smart, and especially, don't be toxic, guys. I'll see y'all later.